<clears throat> okay, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7 and read through the end of the chapter. Starting in which verse? Seven. Seven. Thank you. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for forty years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today, the, that none of you may, harden, may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold fast our original confidence to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who, who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who, who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was, the, was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And who and to whom did he swear that he would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are just so thankful that we got to share in a time of worship to you, Lord, to give you the glory, Lord, that you deserve. And we know, Lord, that we'll be praising you throughout all eternity. And in everything we do, we praise you, Lord. We just, we know that that uh, that our lives are are songs of praise to you, God. And I pray now, Lord, that we would be humbled enough to hear from you today, that you would speak through me, your servant, Lord, and that you would fill me with your Spirit, that I might preach words that are true to you and would edify uh, us as a body, Lord. And I pray for each one of us today that we would go out from here. Um, edified and renewed in our hearts and in our souls to face the challenges of this week, God, and that you, each one of us, Lord, that you would fill us today with your spirit so that we might face those challenges that this week would bring to us, God. And Lord, we pray against Satan. We pray against his minions. We pray, Lord, that you would protect us during this time. We pray, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around us by your spirit and by your holy angels. And that we would, um, we would be able to take this time to wipe out all sleepiness from our mind, all distraction, Lord, from the outside world, and truly be able to focus in on what you have for us today. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've been up front with you all about my proclivities to order things from late night television. As you know, I have a uh, stack, a plethora, and I've even whittled this stack down to some degree of videos and audios and CDs and tapes and all kinds of stuff and little booklets of things that I have gotten from watching late night infomercials thinking that it would help improve my life. And as the refrain, and if you've, I'm sure, even if you've never bought anything, I'm sure you've seen these videos, you know, you've seen this act now and, and, uh, uh, and this is going to help you. You're going to learn how to uh, sell real estate or, you know, you're going to improve your life in some way. But the big draw on these things is that you have to, and I'm sure you can hear this refrain in your head because they say it over and over again, act now, time is running out, this offer won't be good forever. And that's to create into you some type of tension so that you take action immediately on what is offered because at some point that offer will be rescinded and you're going to miss out. 
Well, with late night television, we can kind of sweep that under the carpet with this whole ideal that they're just trying to create tension so that you'll buy their product. But with God, it's more serious. And that is that there is not always going to be the same level of opportunity, of same level of spiritual opportunity offered out at all times that he does rescind his offer and in one sense that's what he's saying here act now time is running out and we know that on the day of judgment he's going when he returns he's going to rescind that offer permanently but in each one of our lives there comes a point where he rescinds that offer even while people are still alive. I've seen that happen before. So individually, yeah, somebody dies and that offer is rescinded, the offer of eternal life, the offer to repent. But I've seen what is called in scripture, judicial hardening in which somebody says no for so long that God says, fine. And even though he doesn't, doesn't kill them, he lets them live. He puts them in a situation where they have been judicially hardened and they can no longer respond to the gospel. They can no longer hear the gospel. This is the difference. So we would ask like, well, what's the difference between just being born a sinner and being born blind and deaf and dead and judicial hardening? Well, it's the difference between covering your eyes and saying, I Sorry, can't see. Did you say that again? I can, I can, and I probably will. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's the difference between covering your eyes and, and, and saying, I'm blind, and then having your eyes dug out of you and being permanently blind. You see, the rebellion of man is inward. It's inward. They don't want to see. Their blindness comes as a result of hatred towards God. It's not that there's something wrong with their eyes. It's there's something wrong with their nature. So their nature says, I don't want to see to the extent that they cover their eyes and they will not see. They will not see. This is why it's, the, it's a cannot, but it's a will not. This is like when we talked about, when we talked about total depravity, when I, when I said, uh, you know, I would like Leslie to take a puppy and stab it to death. It's like, I just can't do that, right? This would never do that, never do that. And it's like, well, listen, oh, so the knife's not sharp? the puppy's skin's not soft. It's like, no, it's not within my nature to do that. It's not within my nature to do such a horrible thing. You could point a gun to my head. All the outward fixations, all the outward um, things that are necessary to do that are there, but your nature prohibits you from doing that. And that is what it's like with the unbeliever. This is why God holds them accountable. It's not that their eyes aren't good. It's that their nature is bad to the point that they are blind. But every once in a while, God involves himself in what's called judicial hardening. Where he says, oh, you don't want to see? Well, I'll just, so instead of having to cover your eyes, I'll just take your eyes from you. And now you really can't see. And that's the difference, and this is what he's talking about here. This is why later it gets so uh, avid where it says that those people who, who repent, who don't, or who leave the faith, it is impossible for them to come back. It's impossible. It puts them in a, in a state of impossibility. Now, I, 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 let's take a step back here and look at what the book of Hebrews is as we get into this passage uh, and get into what's being said here. We must remember that the book of Hebrews is a book about warnings. It's a warning passage built on a theology. The theology is that Jesus is better and Jesus is greater. But he's bringing all that up to say, don't go back, don't go back. Stay with Jesus no matter how bad it is. That theology is being brought up to give you the warning not to go back, the warning not to fall away from the faith. But here's the confusion. The confusion is, and I, and I, I know we're not confused on this issue, but I want us to be even less confused. I want us to be rock solid on this. The confusion is, is we see people falling away from the faith. Somebody comes along and says, well, you see, you can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation. These people were Christians, and now they're not Christians. And that is simply far from the truth. But you'll talk to somebody who's like a five-point Arminian, and they'll, they will 
draw upon these passages and they will draw upon like Hebrews 6. We're not done with this. This is all, I mean, we're all dealing with warning here. This is warning after warning after warning to try to prove their case. And here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to um, think that you have to fudge here. Like, I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to build your theology somewhere else and go, well, I know that's clear, but I don't know what this means. So I'm going to go, well, yeah, I, I don't want you to do that. I, I don't want you to be in that position. I want you to see here in these verses that these verses do not teach that you can lose your salvation. In other words, we don't want to be, how can I say this? We don't want to be in a situation where we're always talking about what a verse doesn't mean. You know, I, I, I get that. I understand that. And I used to do this a lot when I was younger. I, you know, uh, um, I used to be into what, what I call quip theology. Like, you know, somebody brings something up, somebody that, I, that disagrees with my theology, or they'll bring up a verse, and I, wouldn't, I, I would look to find out, okay, what do we not mean by that? What don't we mean by that? And I would just, I would hammer that. This is okay. What we don't mean, I would learn the little, little saying, the little quip, boom. And sometimes it's, that's good. It's as good as far as it goes, but it's not, it's not all the way because this was not written to tell you what he's not saying. Okay, he's saying something here. He's not writing this to say, to say, and this is what I don't mean. You know, he's, he's telling you something here. So, for example, a quip theology for me uh, would have been like when a Jehovah's Witness would come and say, see, it says the Father is greater than I. Father is greater than I, no Trinity, right? They'll say that. And then I learned the quip, which is good, and you should learn it too. Uh, and that is, yes, the president is greater than me, but he's not less human than me. Greater and lesser doesn't have anything to do with quality of person or quality of existence. So God, yes, is the Father is greater than the Son, but that doesn't mean the Son's less deity. Just like the president's greater than me, but he's not more human than me. Okay, but that's not, but the, that's great. But Jesus did not say the Father is greater than me to tell you what he didn't mean. Jesus said the Father is greater than me to show you that he's coming as a revelation from God, a revelation from God the Father to tell you everything about him, that although you can see Jesus and we can hear Jesus, that there's a Father up there who you cannot see and cannot hear. He's telling you that there is some sense in which God the Father is greater than him. Not in deity, not in deity, but in position, but in position. So he's telling you that the Father is greater. So what does it mean here? So this passage is a warning passage, and I really want, to, I really want you to see this. I, I skipped over this last week, but look here in uh, verse 6 and also in verse 14. In verse 6 it says, But Christ was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are, if indeed we hold fast, our faith and confidence in our boasting and our hope. And in verse 14, it says, for we have come to share in Christ if we, indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Okay, so it's so you, you can hear somebody who's on the other side of this issue say, see, look, I mean, you, if you keep it, then you're saved. And if you don't, then you lose your salvation. But that is not what is happening here. What's happening here is this is an if, that's like saying, if you are a Southerner, you will say pecan instead of pecan. You'll say pecan if you are a Southerner. So there's something that exists first, and that gives rise to what exists after. So if you say, you, if you say pecan, you are a Southerner instead of saying pecan. Now, going around saying pecan, pecan, pecan does not make you a Southerner. You can say it till the day, till the cows come home. That doesn't make you a Southerner. But, and I know I'm painting with a broad brush right now because I know that people speak differently. I'm just using this as an example, please. I'm painting with a mop at this point. Uh, but you understand, like, the condition is not, the condition is not, well, if you don't do that, then you've lost your salvation. That's not what the condition is. He's saying, if, he's saying, because you have salvation, you will act in this way. And this is actually the structure of this. Look at verse 14. I'm skipping ahead here, but we're going to get back to these other verses in just a moment. But I just didn't, I did not want to skip over this. It says, now notice the condition here. 
For if, for we have come to share in Christ. Now that's a past tense. We have come to share in Christ. That's past tense. That's not a condition of this, but it says, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Now switch that and you'll see what he's not saying. Okay, or switch that and you'll see what he is getting at. I should say that. It's not if we, hold, if we don't hold fast, then we haven't come to share. That's what he's saying. If we don't hold fast, then the past action hasn't happened. If we don't hold fast, not that you were God's house and now you're not God's house, but if we don't hold fast, then we haven't come to share. Coming to share, then, is the precondition of if this is happening. So this is a following out. This is, if you're, if you're a southerner, you're going to say pecan. You're not going to say pecan. So that's the kind of if that this is. So we don't have to run away from this. We don't have to go, oh, well, these are just, we don't have to brush over it, in other words. We can look at these verses here and hold our confidence in what we believe. We don't have to go and stack a bunch of verses and then say, well, on this one, boy, I'm just not sure, or just kind of brush over it. Okay, so when we're getting to this section of scripture here, we're getting to one of those, as I've already established, a warning passage, but the warning is real and the warning is, uh, is intended for us to take heart. Now, here's how I want to break this down. I, you know how I like alliteration. So I did it last week. I'm going to do it this week too. Okay, here's the, here's the alliteration. Word, warning, way of the unbeliever. Okay, word, warning, way of the unbeliever. That's how we're going to break this down. Word, warning, and way of the unbeliever. Notice the first thing he does here in verse 7. He says, Therefore the Holy Spirit says, and I want you to notice several things about the word here. Number one, I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit, he's attributing the Word of God to the activity of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't simply say, David said, he says the Holy Spirit says. The Holy Spirit is that which is responsible for inspiring the human author. Now, he's not taking away from the human author at all, but what he is doing here is he is proving the deity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is often sometimes the, 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 the part of the Godhead that we don't talk about as, as much. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate because the Bible is very strong in the deity of the Holy Spirit, as well as in the deity of the Son. Now, I know why we talk about the Son more, because that's the forefront of the battle. I mean, everybody's talking about who Jesus is. Even in Jesus' day, the people were talking about who Jesus is. He says, who do this, who people say the Son of Man is? He says, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're this. Some say you're that. He says, yeah, but who do you say that I am? But the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is just as much deity as the other two persons of the Trinity are. And here is one of those spots where we see this, where he is attributed to writing the uh the scriptures and you want to see this as well the deity of the holy spirit turn to second thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5 Now, now, follow this carefully, because it says here, may the Lord direct your hearts. Okay, so now this is the Lord directing your hearts. Now, who's the Lord in this? He's directing your heart to two places. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. So who's the third person there who's directing your heart to the other two? It is the Holy Spirit himself, the Lord directing your heart to God and to Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is deity. The Holy Spirit is called the Lord here. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17.
In verse 16, it says, <clears throat> But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, I don't know how words could get any plainer than that, but the Lord is the Spirit. And we see this when it comes to the Scripture itself. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And uh, that's when we all know that, that God breathed out. I don't know, you don't necessarily have to turn there if you don't want to. But that God breathed out the Scripture. God breathed out the Scripture. God breathed out the Scripture. And when we turn back to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7, who is the God who breathes out Scripture? It is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit says. The second thing I want you to see about the word here is that it's current. Notice that what it says. Well, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit said. It says the Holy Spirit says. In other words, what God said back then, he says to you as well. This is why the Bible, as it will go on to say, is active and sharper than a two-edged sword. The Holy Spirit says. When you're reading the Bible, these aren't just passive words about events that took place in the past. At, but, the, but these are events that took place in the past which apply to you, and the Holy Spirit says it to you as well. Turn to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 31. Passage we looked at this morning. And this is Jesus dealing with the Sadducees. And they give him that, you know, who didn't believe in the resurrection. And they give him that, well, there was this one woman and she was married to seven brothers. Who she's going to be married to in the resurrection? And in verse 31, Jesus responds to this. Well, in verse 29, he said he responds to this. He says, you are wrong because you do not know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but like the angels of heaven, but they are like the angels of heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read uh, what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Mm -hmm. So when we speak, when we read the word of God, we must not read it in just this passive kind of intellectual stay away about events that just happened in the past but these are things that God writes to us the third thing I want you to see about this is that God that, that he is using the Old Testament to speak to New Testament Christians this means that the whole Bible is ours it isn't just well the Old Testament is for Jewish people and the New Testament is for Christian people but the whole Bible is ours everything about the Bible is ours. Turn to a couple places. I want you to see the reinforcement of this. And that is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in verses 1 through 5, he's kind of retelling the story of Moses and how they all came out of the of the uh, uh, of Egypt and passed through the Red Sea, and what they and what they did in the rock that followed them, and they drank from the spiritual rock, which was Christ. But now look at verse six. It says, "Now these things took place as examples for us, as some of them, um, sorry. Now these things took place examples for us that we might." not desire evil as they did so why did these things take place these took things these things took place for our example turn to acts chapter 3 and verse 24. so this is the one where the dispensationalists like to run from by the way so it's just, I can't, I can't help it. Sorry, I just can't help it. All right. Uh, and all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel to those who came after him also proclaimed these days. They proclaimed these days. So when you're reading Samuel and you're reading these prophets, you're supposed to ask yourself, how does that apply to me today? How does that apply to us? 
you know, I, I talk about that where they try to separate the church in Israel and they'll try to say like, well, that was for Israel and this is for the church. It's like, no, no, Samuel, those promises and all those things and that Jesus, that Jesus or that, that, that the Old Testament prophet wrote were for us, were for today. So the word, it was Holy Spirit driven. It is current to our situation and all of God's word applies to us today. Now we get to the warning. Here's the warning. Look here. In verse 7 again, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in, re in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where our fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts and, and my ways they have not known. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. The first thing I want you to understand about this is just kind of the historical context in which he's, in which he's pulling from. And by the way, this psalm was read in their synagogues every Sabbath. So he's not, not pu pulling upon something that they don't know. He's pulling upon something that they would know actually very, very well. It's actually the psalm that says that there's a song on it too. It says, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. Well, this comes out of that very psalm. But what's he referring to? What's the example that he's talking about? And it's important that we have this example in our minds because this is going to be the very example that he uses um, that he uses throughout chapter 4 as well. So he uses it here, and then he uses it in chapter 4. So it's good that we have this in our brain. Now, of course... The whole 40 years is a time of testing, is a time of failure for them. But, and he brings that up here. But out of that 40 years, there was one specific test that he's referring to here. And it's found in Numbers chapter 13, chapter 14. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll just summarize it for you. But a lot of people kind of are under the impression, and sometimes we forget, that that, that, that all the 40 years in the wilderness were all kind of created equal. That's not true. They were intended to stay only two years in the wilderness. They, they came down, if you look at the Red Sea, it divides up in kind of these two horns. And they came from the upper part of Egypt down to that second horn and crossed over. And this is why they come from Israel from this way and not Israel straight up. And they came from, from that way. They were supposed to be there for two years to build the tabernacle and learn all the laws that they had to learn and learn from God. After those two years, what happened was is they got to the edge of Israel, the edge of the promised land, and they sent in 12 spies. And those 12 spies came back and two of them had good report and 10 of them had a bad report. The two that had a good report, this is going to be on your Bible Q&A, the two that had a good report were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb had a good report. The rest of the ten had a bad report. They had a bad report. And the people believed uh, the ten bad ones instead of the two good ones. And so God swore in his anger that day that they would not enter his rest. He says, and, then, and he says, and now you will die in the wilderness. So then from that, you have 38 years of them in the wilderness dying off until that new generation uh, grows up and is able to take the promised land. And the only people of that original generation who were able to take the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. And by the way, possibly the priests, possibly, because it says of the numbered men, you're not. So the priests weren't numbered. So some people think that the Levites did go in. So that's just letting you know a little debate there, that whether or not the Levites all, di Levites all died out uh, as part of that might be true, it might not. It says of the numbered men, they were all going to die out. So the Levites and Joshua and Caleb uh, went in. Possibly the Levites, possibly not. just depends on how you translate that. But they were a day too late. You see, on the very next day, these people realized, these people realized that what they, that they believed the, the wrong report. And they said, now we'll do it. Now we'll do it. See, they were a day too late. 
And we all know what happened to them. They said, well, we'll go and we'll go into the promised land and we'll take it. And God was with us. It says, no, God swore in his wrath that you would not enter into the promised land. You see, they were a day too late and they tried to enter into the promised land on their own, thinking God was behind them. And then they got killed off. Many of them got killed off at that time. And so this is why he brings this psalm up to them. He says, while it's today, don't let, don't let this day go by without, uh, without receiving these promises. Don't let, while it's still called today, because you don't have tomorrow and you don't know when God is going to rescind that. And I look at people who have walked away from the faith. We know that people who walk away and stay away, they are never saved in the first place. And even this verse teaches that. <clears throat> My question for them is, can you still hear God's voice? As long as you can still hear God's voice, you still have a chance. But there comes a day when those people who walk away, they no longer hear God's voice anymore. This is why it says today, if you hear his voice, so, you're, so you could imagine somebody sitting in the congregation with this struggle of whether or not to go back to Judaism and all the excuses. Well, life, we're going we're gonna to escape Roman persecution. It's not the atheism. It's not the pantheism. It's not, the, it's not all the, the horrible things. It's still, it's still monotheism. We still got the Old Testament. We still got all this stuff. And, he, and you could hear him struggle, but you could hear this person, the, the voice of God coming to them, don't leave, don't leave. Don't leave today while well, it's called today. So this is a passage of exhortation. The second thing I want you to see about this warning is that he exhorts them lovingly. He exhorts them warmly. Notice this. He still calls them brothers. Now, I know he knows that some of them are going to depart from there. But it says to take care. In verse 12, it says, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief. So he's not reasoning them with them with this kind of cold, Calvinistic, you know, oh, well, you've messed up and now I am going to write you off forever. This is it. You know, he's still exhorting them warmly. He still calls them brothers, even though some of them are toying with this, uh, this uh, horrible sin to apostatize. He still calls them lovingly, but he also calls them looking at the true issue. The true issue is evil. When you think of evil, when I say, hey, what's evil in the world? I know what you think of. I know, I know, I know, I know all the things pile up in your mind. But is that what the Bible calls evil? Notice what he says here. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart. All sin can be traced back in one way or another to unbelief, to not believing God over whatever else it is, to not believing God and what he says about what's right and wrong over against whatever else it is that's pulling at your heart. An unbelieving heart is an evil of heart. The other thing about this exhortation is that it is constant. And look at verse 13. He says, but exhort one another every day as long as it's called today as long as it's today and you still have god's you can still hear, hear god's voice you can hear god you can repent it's not too late there might come a day act now time is running out it says for we have come to share in the citizens uh, if we hold fast our confidence firm to the end as it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And finally, he calls them urgently. He calls them urgently. Okay, that's the warning. Now, the way of the unbeliever. And the verse 16 through verse 19 are three sets of, of, of questions. They're actually six questions. There are six questions, but... The second of the two questions are rhetorical. They answer the first question. So you have question one and then another question which answers the first question, question two, which answers the second question, and question three answers the final question. So here are the six questions and they each tell us something here. So it says, for who 
were those who heard Moses and yet rebelled. Was it not those who left Egypt by Moses? This tells us of a great privilege. This is a great privilege. Who was it that fell? Who, was, who were these people? For who were those who rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? This speaks of their great privilege. They started out great. They were there to see the miracles of Egypt. They were there to see the plagues. They were there to see that when it was dark everywhere else, it was light in their houses. They were there to see the plagues uh, on Egypt alone. They had great privilege. They were there when the Red Sea crossed. They started out well, but they didn't end well. It doesn't matter how well you start out. It matters how you end. It's more important how you end. In the Bible, whenever it's talking about how you know you're saved, it never says, well, there was there a born again experience? I am so thankful that that's true. But you understand that when Paul and, and, and this book and all these people when they, in the Bible, when they say, how do you know you're saved? They say, what is happening now? That's what they point you to. Do you believe now? Are you following now? None of them say, what happened to you in your past? Can you point to a day when you were, uh, when you were not a believer and then you became a believer? Can you point to that time? None of them do that in the New Testament. Whenever the examination is, is if you are saved, it's always what are you doing right now, not what happened to you in the past. You don't, know, you don't have to know when the sun comes up to know that the sun is up, okay? You don't have to know that. It's not important that you have, uh, uh, it's not important, as important that you have a born again experience as that the sun's up, because you might not know when your born again experience happens. This, ha this happens with a lot of people for different reasons. Now, some people know, they know the day that they were saved. They know that that, that happened, and that's awesome. But that's not how you tell you're saved. How you tell you're saved is what you're doing now, not what happened to you a while back. Some people don't have a, don't have a well, we all have a born again experience, but some people can't point to it because it either happened when they were very, very young or it happened gradually. So we have to make the difference between decay and, and, uh, and life and death right? Decay and life and death. You understand the difference. So life and death is just, it's one or the other. You're either alive or dead, you, but decay is not the same. Decay happens over a period of time. And for a lot of people, what God does is he'll remove the decay out of their life to the point that it becomes very, very, a very small thing when they become, when they become spiritually dead to spiritually alive. You know, they might have given up a lot of um, past sins over a course of time, and then they can't tell exactly when they became born again. But that's not the point. Like I said, the Bible always says, what are you doing now? What's going on now? You don't have to know when the sun came out, came out to know that the sun is up. Okay, so this speaks of a tremendous privilege. The next section speaks of a tremendous patience. Look at verse 17. And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? This speaks of God's enormous patience with them. By the way, those people who did not believe in Joshua and Caleb, they were still forgiven. Okay, They were still forgiven. The people, the bad spies were killed right away. But a lot, but those people who lived in the wilderness, who died in the wilderness, were forgiven people. Which points us to the fact that even though sometimes we can be forgiven for something, sometimes God allows us to experience those consequences. Turn, turn back to, I just want to show you this, turn back to Numbers chapter uh, 14 for just a second.
this is in the middle of this, so I'm, I'm just lifting one verse out, but I trust that you go, you can go back and read this for yourself. But in verse 13, that's when they go in. In verse 14, they come back and they have the bad, and they have the bad report. But look at verse 20. It says, the Lord said, this is about the people who believed the bad spies. The bad spies died right away. But this is about the people who believed the bad spies. It says, then the Lord says, I have pardoned them according to your word. So these people were pardoned. Their sins were forgiven. They died in the wilderness, complaining for sure. They died in the wilderness as believers. This doesn't mean that God doesn't, doesn't um, make us accountable for our bad decisions. And God makes us accountable for our bad decisions because he loves us. Okay, so that we'll learn. We'll learn <laughs> not to do that. Oh, goodness, sorry. That's all right. So we'll we'll learn our lesson. But it says the bodies fell, so so he was patient with these people. This speaks of their patience. The final set of questions speaks to their their great punishment. So privilege, patience, punishment. And whom did he swear that he would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Okay, so this, this, they put a comma here. You understand the commas, and that's not how it was originally written in Greek. It says in verse 18, And to whom did they swear that they would not enter their rest? Question mark. But to those who were disobedient? question mark. That's why there's a question mark at the end in the ISV. Those are two questions there. This speaks to their great punishment, their great punishment. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The demarcating line then is unbelief. Unbelief was the reason that they believed the spies, the bad spies instead of the good spies unbelief is going to be the reason why ultimately people are not going to make it into the true promised land, into heaven, because of unbelief. And he's warning them there too, don't fall in to unbelief, because that is going to be the bottom line, that evil unbelief is going to be the bottom line, fundamental reason why somebody ultimately abandons the faith and goes into judicial hardening because at some point God says and I've seen this happen I think I, you've probably seen this happen with people it's a little eerie when it happens they're they're in a and it happens with people who are in a pit place of privilege they're ultimately in this place of awesome privilege over and over again they just get, can see the the glory of God being poured out and then for one reason or another they leave and they get to the point where God says, all right, if you want to go, you can go. I will no longer call you. And this speaks to us today for people that we might be talking to. Sometimes we get this, this attitude. Some people, I've heard this attitude before. Well, when I'm older, I'll repent. You know, I want to have my fun now. And when I'm older, I'll turn. You don't have that guarantee. It's not, they look at salvation like a vending machine, like, you know, like I put the quarter in, I turn the handle, and then the, and salvation comes out. That's not salvation. Salvation is an act of God. You hearing God's voice now is a merciful act of him. He might be silent later. He might be silent on your deathbed. He might be silent at a time where you say, oh, well, now I'm ready to repent. He might, you draw near to him while he is near, because he might not come near later on. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are just so grateful that you give us these warning passages. And I know, Lord, they serve a dual purpose. They show who, who is and who isn't saved. But for the Christian who are saved, it helps us, Lord, to be inspired to hold more fastly to belief in our faith in you as the Messiah. So, Lord, we ask, God, that you would please uh, bl uh, bless our time as we turn it towards taking communion and that you would be with us throughout the rest of this day and, out without, and throughout the rest of this week. And we say this in Christ's name. Amen.
So as usual, 